Oh, well, I think I think it's fair to say in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, the citizens' expectation of the state and of public administration is, has um, been hugely increased. Quite simply, people expect the government and public institutions to provide them with services and uh, information in a timely way, digitally, that is appropriate for their lifestyles and in a similar level of professionalism to the digital services that we all use to participate in daily life. So the demand level from citizens has, has become very high. In doing so, that has, I think, um, meant that many citizens and users of services have started to ask questions of their governments that they didn't ask before. So, you know, why am I getting this sort of service? Do I need to answer all these questions? Who holds the data about about um, about these services and how are they provided? And I think it's led to a period of people reconsidering positively the role of government in daily life. I like to think that it has been one of the reasons why there is a, a more engagement with users between citizens and, and government institutions, because in an era where democracy is under threat, then having more engagement is a positive thing. Building the, the experience of the, I wouldn't say customer, of the user, is um, there has to be a defined public user experience. Now in the UK, when we digitized most of our services, we had a phrase, the, you know, what, what are the user needs? And the reason we use the word user, not citizen or, or um, subjects or, or business, is that there are many, many users of government services. They are people, individuals, groups of people, they are businesses and so on. And there are many words that government has for people, whether they be, you know, immigrant or taxpayer or benefit claimant or so on and so forth. And many of those words are very loaded. They have much cultural meaning. So we took the word user to try and make that neutral. And I think it's important that one of the characteristics of public services is that they recognize the users of the services as users, not in a pejorative sense. So perhaps you might not like paying your tax, um, who does, but it's a part of the democratic process. So making the tax system and tax collection to be less punitive and less difficult was seen as a, a good way to engender trust. So I think that your, your question is, the central issue question is that governments need to design public services to embody the characteristics that they would like to see in the public domain. And too often governments have thought about public services of, oh, well, we, we have some technology. It's like, well, technology itself isn't going to get you anywhere. You have to design public services to embody the characteristics. Now, in a digital world where things are simple and services are created to be simple and improve over time, then the uh, the opportunity was to create a single way in with gov.uk and to have us to say to people, look, every time you use a service, whether it's a driving license or a passport or whatever it is, it will look pretty much the same and it will look part of government. And in digitally, we speak with one voice in government. Um, the reasons to not do this, it is so self-evidently better for users and for governments. The reasons to not do this are all internally to governments themselves, because a department wants to say, well, I, I want my own website with my own picture of my minister on. And the truth is no one ever looks at them. And it's, it is just institutional vanity. There is no reason to... to to have all these, to have this complexity. Now, there are some reasons why some parts of the state need to be kept separate digitally. So for instance, 
the judicial part of the state or the armed forces. Of course, they may need to have a different domain. But most of the state, most of the time, is about service design and service delivery. And in digitally, if you make those easy and simple and consistent, a number of things happen. Firstly, more people get to use their services more quickly and more cheaply, and they get a better outcome. So you have an economic benefit. You have a trust benefit because people then start to trust the state. And also, you then have you then have a benefit that comes from developing services based on lots of user feedback of the same thing. So you start to get better and better services. But that takes institutions to recognize that their own internal logic is often a complete waste of time. The main thing to do is to design services for, if you like, the standard use case. So most people can use uh, uh, any new, any digital service, about 85% of users should be able to use it. In our experience, the other 15% fall into two categories that can't, uh, they are unwilling to use it or the unable to use it. For people who are unable to use it, you need to provide you know, extra provision that can be users to help them, call centers, so on and so forth. It's quite simple that you can't expect everyone to use a digital service. But if you design a service simply and you look at what people are using it for and how they're using it and keep making changes, I mean, make it accessible, that's that's sort of um, not that's a hygiene factor. And then you will find that a majority of people, you know, a vast majority of people will use it. We had a phrase designing services so good that people want to use them. Um, as for the people who who are refusing to use them, then it's really a question of political legitimacy is whether you offer a different channel like do you go completely digital for some services or do you also have a a paper channel a telephone channel um and that's really a political decision it often depends on the service it may be and i don't know catalonia well enough but it may be that there are intermediaries you provide that service in the uk we have places like the citizens advice bureau and sure start centers and others sorry not um that there are learning centers and others that um, that provide sort of intermediary services. But essentially I'd focus on developing for the mainstream and then making sure third parties and other state actors can deliver people, can deliver for people who can't use services. The idea of subsidiarity plays very well with the idea of digital government because different modules and elements of digital services can be devolved to the lowest level of political power. And we've not really seen that done well yet. And I think we should see that, you know, it's not enough. I look around the world globally, there's not enough good examples of where national governments are working well digitally with state and local authorities. Well, it's nice to have the utility that sometimes they provide, the personalization, but that personalization provided by private companies is often because of extractive data policies. And you don't really want your government to do some of those things. So I think the extra piece of utility that you get from Netflix, knowing your preferred viewing habits or your banking, knowing your preferred eating habits or whatever, or spending habits, you probably don't want agencies of the state having that level of insight into your activity. So I would draw, I would recommend that rather than have personalization, which often, as I say, is based on extract to data practices, one should give the citizen the ability to control their and manage their own data. So for instance, one of the things that is irritating to citizens is constantly having to tell different public institutions their name, their address, and so on. And they think, why doesn't government have this? And the reason government doesn't have it is there's no one seat of government. There's lots of different parts of government. So give users the ability to share that rather than have, have all the different 
parts of government ask them for the same data. Now, that's a piece of utility that would be helpful. But in terms of personalization, I'm not sure that's a, a great idea. I think there is a real concern, uh, obviously, about artificial intelligence. An ungenerative AI means that there will be an awful lot, there already is an awful lot of uh, content being created artificially, which will be wrong or certainly won't have provenance. And I think that that's very bad for the internet. Um, it's it's full of biases already because it's mostly English and mostly male and all the rest of it. Um, but also it means that there will be a higher desire for provenance. So like, am I actually talking to the government or am I talking to a chatbot or anything else? And I think what government should realize is now there is a premium on being an authoritative voice. And actually it's another reason why governments really need to have a single recognizable brand that cannot be imitated or copied so that people can have the trust digitally that they are dealing with their government.